Well, Greg, it's really, really good to meet you, man. Oh, pleasure to, to be here. You was one of the first films that when Big Flick started back in 2006, that yours was one of the films to play. It's made for, you know, a pit, a pit it's really, wasn't it? Can you tell us a little bit about that film? And Yeah, I mean, my first feature, I was 22 years old. It was made for three and a half grand. Um, I did that thing that they always tell you not to do, don't go and make a film on a credit card or borrow money. Uh, that's exactly what I did. Um, I got a credit card, borrowed money of friends, and the plague was inspired by the group of friends I grew up with, um, but also really came to life by the, the kind of untrained talent that I worked with, the real kind of raw actors. Um, and I just wanted to tell my story of me and my friends growing up, and it was nuts to think how far the plague was such a launch pad for me and it makes me feel old now thinking back how long ago that was um, but yes it's kind of set me on a, a good path and it was one of the first films before things like bullet boy kid adulthood before that whole kind of urban wave of, of british um, cinema the plague was really one of those earliest films and was one of the earliest films to ever be released online as well so yeah it was um, a big learning curve for me that project and I still think, you know, the projects I make now, um, I have a similar voice, but I've really developed as a filmmaker from that early 20, um, kind of naive filmmaker. And did it earn enough money to pay your credit card off? It did actually, just about it made enough money. Um, the fact it was made for three and a half grand, the BBC obviously bought the TV rights. The distributor did go bust on it. Um, obviously it first came out around 2004, its cinematic release was around 2006. Um, I ended up actually bootlegging and selling my own copies of the film. So I actually pirated my own film. Not that I That's obviously, great. That's great. yeah, I don't <laughs> I, I encourage um, piracy. But when you, the director himself is selling it for a fiver, I did make the money back. So yeah, it meant I could keep on making films. And did it open doors for you? Definitely opened a lot of doors. I mean, someone joked that I made the plague to to get a foot in to the door. And actually what the plague did was literally kick the door off the hinges. Um, it did major festivals, you know, some big filmmakers, um, everyone from Mike Lee to Hugh Hudson to Sandy Lieberson um, kind of knew about me and hyped me up. The press was fantastic. Um, so it was great as a young filmmaker in the early 20s. Obviously there's a downside to that, you know, when I was making it, I was still signing on. I was unemployed um, during the day and then going to red carpet events in the night. So there was kind of like getting my head around that and being in my early 20s, like so much happened with it. I probably wasn't in the right place as a young person to deal with all that, but you know, you can't look back with any regrets. It was a great learning curve and it's taught me a lot about the film industry. And the biggest thing is I've just kept going. I've never given up. And I think in this industry, like of all creative industries, it's actually about keep on persevering and not giving up. Did, did you have distribution deal in place when you made it? or? You completed the film that you just sort of tapped it away. No, the plague was made for, for nothing. Um, and we just started, it started doing the festival circuit with no distribution. And it was doing quite big festivals and, and getting really good kind of critical response. It did the London Film Festival and we still had no distributor. In 2005, it experimented. It was the second ever feature film to be re released online. Um, at the time, we were told that no one would ever distribute films on the internet. Um, we got about 150 downloads, which for 2005 is probably quite good considering that the, the technology wasn't there for people to stream it. Um, but then in 2006, the BBC bought the TV rights and an independent distributor did a cinematic and DVD release. Um, and then, like I say, I then ended up putting it out myself through my own kind of imprint called Broke But Making Films. So then you say open doors for you. Was you something then earning money as a filmmaker? Um, I was doing like music videos, um, so my bread and butter around the time of the plague was doing music videos for Benjamin Zephaniah, I was one of the biggest artists who I did four um, videos off his album, so Benjamin actually helped me become self-employed um, and ended up doing a lot of teaching work, working with young people, um, working with like disadvantaged young people in pupil referral units because I was a young filmmaker myself and the stories and the, the the tales, I guess, the plague looked at uh, of inner city lives um, w was very relatable to a lot of young people. So that, that kind of got me into that 
area of work, which is something I'm very passionate about, how cinema and filmmaking is such an incredible medium for expressing and telling stories that we can actually reach a lot of vulnerable youth. Um, so yeah, a lot of work came from it, but it's, it's nothing I could say, oh, I earned X amount of money, or I had a moment where it was like, I felt like I had made it. I don't think you ever really feel that in the industry. I think you get, there's moments where you have highs and lows, and the highs when there's lots of press, everyone that knows you thinks you're popping off. But the reality of it is, like I said earlier, it's about perseverance. It's about building a career and kind of the long goal. Did you have any formal training? And I, I went to art school um, and studied film in Farnham, which was a, like a hands-on production course. So actually, this was just around the time of the digital revolution. So I had learned digital, um, but also learned to shoot on film and cut with film. Um, so I was using steam becks, cutting and splicing 16 mil. Um, but to be honest, I started teaching myself around the age of 14. Um, I got a home video camera and I used to put my dad and all my family in films and I used to press play on the video camera and run it into an old VHS machine and would pause and record. So I edited it all on domestic equipment. But what that meant is, if you know anything about pause and record, if you leave it longer than two minutes, it comes off and it leaves a glitch. So I would have to cut an entire short film, like a 15 minute film, in one sitting. So if I needed the toilet, I'd have to <laughs> pause and record, line up my next cut on the camera, run to the toilet, go to the toilet, come back, and then do the next edit. And if I missed that window of opportunity, I'd have to recut the entire film. So I'd say the discipline towards editing and filmmaking, you know, was something I was learning around 14 and 15, just from doing it all myself with domestic equipment. Cool, that's, that's pretty inspirational. Cool. <laughs> You've got another film coming out soon. It's, it's probably your biggest film to date. Definitely, yeah. You've waited a long time for it to actually hit the, uh, hit the shelves to be released. Um, how did it come about? How did you get involved in directing Bonded by Blood 2? Um, Bonded by Blood 2 was literally after my fourth feature, which I crowdfunded, a film called Communion. Um, we got a friend of mine, a really good actor, uh, called Nick Nevin, who had, uh, you probably know Nick. Yeah. Um, who I had known about myself um, from my first feature, The Plague. Nick, it, it, people know him as a big Snapchat star and a big actor, uh, but Nick is also an old school graffiti writer and uh, it, amongst the hip hop community, he's really well known. So, uh, Nick and myself, we've known about each other from MySpace and The Plague, that's how long we've known each other. I got Nick to be in communion, just to have a little cameo, just to help have another face in it. Um, Nick, actors like Lee Ingleby and Roger Griffiths all worked on that film for free. Um, and off the back of that, um, I then was offered a commercial project, firstly with a producer called Simon Phillips. Um, I was approached to do a film about a bank robbery, um, which got missold as a hooligan film called Dangerous Mind of a Hooligan. Um, but its original title was This is a Robbery. The film did quite well. Um, it was put out through Signature, um, sold a lot of units, and from that project, Jonathan Sothcott then saw that and invited me in. I went and had coffee with Jonathan and with Neil Jones at the time. And originally we spoke about doing a project. I kind of gave him a treatment. Um, it was something called Trappers. It was like an urban, a bit maybe like the plague, but it never kind of really took off. And then suddenly Jonathan just called me um, after a few weeks and said, look, Bonded by Blood 2, the money's here to make it. I know we spoke about something else. Would you consider reading the script and taking it on board? And you know, I said I'd read it, and I wanted to work with Jonathan. I kind of liked, I, you know, I've got a lot of time for these guys that in the independent uh, British um, home entertainment world, these guys that can raise money and get films on the shop shelf and to an audience. That model amazes me, especially as an indie filmmaker from my background. Um, so I kind of wanted to be involved with Jonathan and with that setup uh, and just, you know, that world of straight to DVD genre kind of work. And it was a great opportunity. It was the biggest budget, the biggest crew. You know, with, with projects like that, I was a director for hire. So there's also an understanding that, you know, you have to, there's leeway with what the producers want, what the distributors want. What I find is that 
they, the distributors and the producers, they, they want to know, they want to put some key stars in there. They want to control the title and the posters of it. But apart from that, you're actually given a lot of freedom. And that was really where I had a lot of fun. That actually on set, working with the actors, the way I shot the film, the way I put the film together, I was given a lot of freedom. So, you know, the biggest thing my dad always said to me, if you dig holes for a living and someone says to you, I'll pay you to come dig a hole over here, you're not going to turn your nose up to it and go, well, I only dig these holes. Of course, you're going to go and do the job. So for me, I'm always thankful for an opportunity to kind of develop my craft. Um, so it's a great opportunity to do Bonded by Blood 2. And uh, from that, there's many great people, crew and cast, that I'm still working with to today. Did you have an input into the casting process? Yes. Um, so the casting was one of the first things we actually did. Um, you know, I got offered the gig and then about a week later, I went to a casting with um, brilliant Lee Mountjoy, fantastic casting director, and with Jonathan. Um, you know, Jonathan's great. Obviously, it is a Jonathan Softcock film, but he was open to some of my suggestions. And to be honest, together, me and him kind of banded the names around and we kind of put that main cast together. And we were both very happy with it. Um, and, you know, I think it comes across in the film that there's some great actors and some fantastic kind of realistic performances in this project. Would you be a producer you'd work for again? We have to see Jonathan's off doing many different things. I've got a few other projects that I'm lining up. Obviously, never would say never to um, anything, never would turn things down. Um, but, you know, Jonathan and Hereford Films are doing their projects. So we'll see. Maybe I'll get offered Bonded by Blood 3. Who knows? Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to spend my career, as you know, from films like The Plague, has been very colourful. And I, I do many different things. And this, for me, is one stepping stone. I'm only 36, I'm what's considered a young director really. I've got six feature films under my belt. So for me this was a stepping stone, it was about working with a big crew, working with projects that are going to go straight out to an audience um, via a decent distributor. So you know, I, I do love British gangster stuff, I love that kind of things, but I do want to push on and, and, and try different things and really um, let my, you know, spread my wings with other projects, so we'll see. I mean, it was a step up for you as a director. Um, did you ever feel under pressure or did you just revel in it? You really enjoyed it? I mean, it was a very pressured project, to be honest. Um, I mean, even Neil and Jonathan said to me, I think on their last day, they went, that was an impossible schedule. We can't believe you did it. And they said, that's one of the most smoothest films we've ever worked on. So it was, you know, for three weeks, we had a lot to shoot. There was a lot on. So, but thankfully, the amazing cast and the amazing crew you know, the, the crew members that never get really uh, a lot of credit, you know, credit. They were the guys putting in ridiculous hours and making the project happen. So there was a bit of pressure in terms of timing, weather, all those things that every production has to deal with. Um, but, you know, it was nice people to work for, so there was no pressure on that side of things. The pressure was, for me, you know, it's, it's a genre that people might not associate myself with. I wanted to bring something really special to it. So the only real pressure was what I was putting myself under. I didn't want to just, you know, just shoot shot, reverse shot, not just do it as a walk in the park. I wanted to try and really get the best shots I could and the best performances I could and, and work with what I had and just get the best out of it. So it was really about putting myself under pressure to try and make the best film possible, to be honest. I like the uh, Mr. X character, Mark Harris, and I like the narration, you know, uh, it just seemed to add something to the film for me, and there were some lovely shots involved in him as well. Yeah. Um, was that was that part of your ideas, or was that put the table and said, "Right, we want to do this"? Or? No, that was that was entirely um, kind of my vision for it, really. Um, for me, Bonded by Blood Two, I mean, it's, it, it sits within the Bonded by Blood franchise through the fact that it has this Mr. X character speaking with Johnny um, Bernie, uh, as yeah. character played by Johnny Palmiro. Um, so the film itself is about telling and retelling of myths. So I love this idea, you know, the Range Rover murders are like a modern folklore for the British working class. It's like Robin Hood, um, the amount of films and just the, the myths around it. And then the fact this script and the story was about a character telling another character about this story, it was constantly about retelling and telling of stories. So I wanted to bring a very bold and very punchy, almost comic book, kind of visual style to it, to complement 
the fact that it's about the retelling of myths. So especially with Mr. X, because he was named as Mr. X, you know, I could have a, a lot of fun with that in how I showed him and how I revealed him. But yeah, throughout, the, the vision was very clear that I wanted to be as artistic and as punchy and just make the storytelling um, as creative as possible, which I think is lacks a lot in a lot of these kind of Essex Boys films. That they're just knocked out, but there's actually no, not much time is spent in getting the visuals and understanding the film language. And that was something I was kind of really passionate about for this. And how was it work, like working for the cast? Yeah, the cast were, it was a fantastic cast. Um, you know, I'm someone who I love to rehearse and love to spend as much time kind of directing actors, not on set, actually doing that in a rehearsal room. Um, the producers were very helpful in that they allowed me to be able to, I did a big group workshop where I got all the actors to come in and we played with the characters um, and then did some individual kind of um, rehearsals where we looked at specific scenes and it just meant when it came to shooting that all the background work, all those relationships, there was more layers there. Um, so I was very, you know, really happy with the performances. There were some key actors that really kind of made it for me. I mean, George Russo and Sam Strike. To me, even though everyone knows like Tony Tucker and this whole Range Rover murders, is actually Bonded by Blood too. This the new generation of Essex boys is this amazing story about the murder of Dean Boschel um, with Damon Albarn and Ricky Percival. So for me, it's about getting that relationship between those friends and between those characters. And almost as a counterpoint, even though the visuals were very much comic book style, I wanted the performances not to be this glitz and glamour that's often associated with British gangster films. And it's kind of untrue. That's not, you know, we never see these people go home and, and go to bed at night and see them as real people. And for me, being given this opportunity, it was making sure Dean and Damon and Ricky, they came across as real people. And I was very lucky that some of the, the, the main performers in there really helped anchor that and bring that across. Yeah, there was, there was some really, really good performances in it. And, you know, it, it just carried the film. That, that there was so many good performances that, you know, I was re really, really overwhelmed by it. You know, I wasn't expecting it to, to, to be such a great movie, mm -hmm. to be honest. Uh, a lot of that comes down to, as well, you know, like I would give actors, uh, and that's how I work, I give them freedom. Uh, and, and Simon Cluett, I should say, the writer, kind of knew my short film, Bruised, so was very excited about me kind of directing the script. And he had said to me, do your thing. Come on, you know, I'm not precious as a writer, which was great. And then obviously the producers allowed me that um, freedom. So I was able to pass that freedom on to the actors. But then it comes down to what the actors bring to the table. You know, Sam Strike really went to town on, on Dean's character. But, you know, someone I have to really kind of bring up is George Russo's performance as um, Damon was, you know, there's bits in it that the audience won't know. There's scenes for what George is playing and he has a real knife in his pocket and his hands on his pocket. And I remember him telling me and Sam afterwards that he was like, his hand was gripping that knife like it was gonna do him. And there, there were scenes where, you know, where there was a scene between George, Sam and, and Josh. And just before we were about to do a take, George leant across and he showed Sam something he'd written on paper and then told him not to say anything. And Josh was like, Josh being Josh as well, Josh was like, what's that about? He wanted to get in on the joke, but George wouldn't let him. And it, it just created a dynamic where George and Sam, as actors, had some kind of power over Josh's character. And it's little tricks like that, that that's when you know you've got a really great actor. And you know, and me and George really went to town in terms of our references. Uh, you know, obscure references that from films like Irreversible to obvious references like Scarface. And one of the, the fact Damon has a little scar over his eye is um, again saying George, as a, comp as a nod to that film kind of came with. So, you know, a director is only as good as the crew I work with and I'm only as good as the actors I work with. So I can give them that freedom, but it's about what they bring to it. Um, so I was very lucky and very blessed to have a great cast. There's a lot of humour in it as well, aren't there? Some really funny humour. I mean, one of my favourite scenes is when they're all sitting around, around the table about how they're going to get revenge on uh, on Tony Denham. Yeah. And one of the guys says about a hand grenade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
and like George uh, yeah, just comes in and says, we're going to get fucking angry when they come, and it, and it, it really is funny, I mean, it's just a cracking movie. Yeah, and I think with, with films like this, with British gangster stuff, you know, everyone loves like the, gla the, the gore and the glamour, but actually how these films work is the humour, and again, I guess it's about finding the core of those real characters. They're just guys in a pub yeah. talking, yeah. and just, they're only known because of this murder. I guess in the same way as like Pat Tate and Tony Tucker, they're only known because of the Range Rover murders. They could have just been normal working class guys working in clubs doing this stuff and sat in pubs and you, you wouldn't know them to walk past them. And I think that, you know, for me, that was really important. It was just about making them real and, and that humor does come across in the film and there's lots of laughs in there. And I think it's really important with, like I say, with projects like this, that they're real people. And, you know, I, in some respects, I always say there's no such thing as a, a comedy, because in real life, we're always cracking jokes, even when it, in our, some of our most darkest times, yeah, we're always telling jokes. So yeah, it was, um, but I was very lucky, like I say, the cast, people really bonded uh, on set, and, and it made those friendships feel really real as well. And because, because it was a true story, or ba you know, based on a true story, you know, you've got, uh, witness protection program, you got people in prison and you got someone dead or a couple, a couple of people dead. Did that, have a, 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 did you sort of take that on board? Did that have a, a sort of an effect on how you died to the film? I, I mean, my approach to it, and you know, you, you could debate whether this is right or wrong, um, was ob obviously, you know, there, there's like the first film as well. So to deal with that, there was like the, the Tony Tucker returning character. And then there was the, f so that was all based on real life. Then there's this whole, um, the issue, did Ricky Percival do it or not? That's based on real life, based on, you know, all from Bernie's book. Now, my attitude to it was firstly, there's not much I can do with the older characters returning because they are, everyone knows them from the first film. So as a director, there's no point in me, you know, sitting down with Terry Stone going, oh, what I want to do with the character is this and that. They know their characters. So what I wanted to focus on was, the new characters and really the story that the film is based on. Now I could have got bogged down in trying to make it real and authentic and doing lots of research, but the, the great thing about this film is it does also pose that did Damon do it or didn't he do it? And actually you could read it as, was it actually Ricky that did the murder? Was, did Damon do the murder? So I think I wanted to have that freedom, not to feel that we're gonna make a film to try and hopefully get someone out of prison or you know that this could be used as a campaign that really it's a story about the retelling and telling of myths whether they're true or not is you know myths are they go beyond truth so for me I guess I gave myself that freedom of going you know what it's not about making a biopic it's about telling a great story that is based in reality but no one actually knows the truth of it like with the Range Rover murders so I kind of had that, used that flexibility for myself to be flexible and not be constrained by saying this has to be exactly accurate to the, the real life events. Well, that's, that's bonded by Bud too. Can you tell us a little bit about now and the future? Yeah, so at the moment, um, they've got some really exciting stuff planned for the future. Off the back of Bonded by Blood too, obviously, you know, when people see it, I think my relationship as a director with, with one of the key leads, George Russo, will really come across from that film. Um, I think we did something very special with that. And it was really fantastic meeting George on set. Um, I guess we were kind of like um, kindred spirits slightly in, in, our, in our taste of films, in our frames of references, just where we were as human beings. You know, what was great was actually we discovered we lived really close to each other. And off the back of Bonded, we started meeting up for coffee, just catching up with each other, and then started writing together. Um, it's been a couple of years since Bonded by Blood 2 was finished. And, and from then since now, myself and George and a producer called Stuart Malcolm Honey, we've set up a company called um, Medium Call Films, um, and also with um, our financial director, Spencer Hall. Um, so we've just set up a production company We've got a slate of projects, uh, five features and a TV series. I don't want to say too much on camera about stuff because I never like saying too much online because whenever you say something, it generally curses it. But we've got some exciting stuff. We're trying to raise money for our first project, which is something that's very close to my heart. 
very close to George's heart. We're, we've got an incredible cast attached to it so far. Um, we're just trying to get the, you know, it's the classic story, we're trying to get the money in place. Touch wood, we'll be shooting it by the end of this year. Um, but yeah, got some exciting things up my sleeve. Uh, some gritty, what you can expect from a Greg Hall kind of film, but some, some genre stuff in there. And a new level of work, the collaboration between me and George, um, as people will maybe get a taster from Bonded by Blood 2, um, you know, that is just a taster. We planted some more seeds and there's some lovely fruit that's going to be reaped from it for these future projects. So keep an eye out for medium cool films. We're under the radar a little bit, but I assure you, the next few months, this next year, um, there'll be things will be announced and will come from us. So keep us posted. Without uh, a doubt, you'll be the first to know. Hopefully, we can come down for a set visit. Without a doubt, it'll be exciting. So, great, really nice to meet you. Thank you, John. Talking to us. Pleasure. Cheers. Lovely. Cheers, mate. Cool.